Um, <laughs> it's Wednesday Bible class, July 31st, and we are picking up in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 48, verses 15 and 16. I would say quick review, but we really want the depth of this. We kind of hurried through it last time. So we're going to pick up with that, and I'm just going to start right there. So we're reading that Yaakov, Jacob is blessing Yosef. This is not part of the blessing that he'll give to the 12 sons, who Joseph is a part of. We'll get that in chapter 49, but this also, I'm sorry, I'm out of breath because I just ran up and down the stairs. <laughs> Catch my breath. <laughs> that means I'm out of shape. Shame on me. Okay, um, but we want to look at a little more in depth because in this is a beautiful picture of the triunity of our God. And I think that's what's so amazing to see because we want, especially our Jewish people, to see when we talk about the triunity, we're talking about three tri unity, one, the three in one. And we see that in our very own Jewish scriptures. Now, having said Jewish scriptures, what are the Jewish scriptures? Bereshit to Revelation. <laughs> it does not change. But commonly, Refer to the Jewish scriptures are usually what you call the old, I call the original covenant because I don't want the connotation old as in old, worn out, you know, something replaced. It's not replaced by the new, the Brachat Hashah that's promised. It is fulfilled, it is completed. What well, sometimes has been concealed is now revealed, but it's one his story. And it's his story. The story of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah. And we see him as the son of God. But in this verse, we also see him as Jehovah, God the Father, and we see the spirit, the Ruch HaKodesh also. So looking at that, with that background in mind, we see that he said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Yitzhak walked, the God before whom Abraham and Isaac, they walked before him. This is referring to Jehovah the Father. This is seeing that um, ancestral aspect of the God who made covenant with what becomes the Jewish nation through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, through his sons, and on. So we see very strongly here, Jehovah the Father. Then we see the next phrase, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. Now, Stay with me, because usually when you hear the word shepherd, you jump to Yeshua Jesus, because he did say he's a good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the chief shepherd. But here in this context, the God who shepherd, who the God who fed him, we know that who feeds us this day is the Ruch Kodesh, the Holy Spirit within us, that he is the one guiding, directing, and feeding. This is taking nothing away from the one who shepherds us, the one who is the great shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. The one who said he is the lamb of God because he also was the sacrificial lamb. So we see many roles, many images, many or imagery, and many pictures. But here we're seeing the personal aspect because they've not been introduced to Yeshua Jesus yet. Now we'll, we'll see as we'll talk, and I think even in this lesson, in fact, yes, we're going to talk about it in the next phrase. We'll see the angel of the Lord, which I fully believe is pre-incarnate Yeshua Jesus. Pre-incarnate means before he came in the flesh, he appeared in a way to people at different times that revealed who he is, a foreshadowing of who is coming. And it's very interesting because not everyone agrees that the angel of the Lord is Yeshua. But from my Hebrew background and my study of it, when you see it say the angel of the Lord, the and usually is Malak, Elohim, the angel of the Lord, or the angel of God, interchangeable. What's very, very interesting is once Yeshua puts on human form, the angel never shows again in scripture. So when you move into the Brit Hadashah, into the four books right in the beginning that speak to Yeshua's earthly life, from that point forward, uh, forward to the end, to Revelation, you don't see the appearance of the angel of the Lord, the Malach Elohim or, or Malach, um, what's the other one, Jehovah. <laughs> so I think that's even proof again, he was foreshadowing himself. Now here's the reality. Well, if you go to someone and you see them and you get all excited and you want to grab their shadow and hug their shadow instead of hugging the real reality, the one who's there, 
they're going to send the little men in jackets to come take you and try to help you. <laughs> That's the point, is once Yeshua took on the human form, he did not and would not pre-foreshadow. I'm saying that awkwardly. He wouldn't foreshadow himself because the real is here. The tangible is here. Hands-on is here. So I just think that's even further proof that we saw in um, in Bereshit, Genesis 16 and verse 7, and verse 13, when he appeared to Hagar, it was the angel of the Lord. And also in chapter 21, verses 17 and 18, and from the Hebrew words, as we went into detail in those chapters, we very much saw a picture of it being uh, the sun. Now notice um, why I'm saying that, and I kind of blended the two, so let me make clear. The one who shepherded Yaakov all the days to, to he was writing or saying this and it's written for us, we said was picture of the Ruch Kodesh, the Holy Spirit, because it's Holy Spirit that was feeding him, directing him, leading him. Okay, and we know all the way through the original covenant, the Old Testament scriptures, the Holy Spirit would come on people to enable them to perform that calling that God had given them, the job to do. Uh, representing him, taking a stand or whatever. But I, I moved myself into the third phrase, which is the angel. Now, this is why I can tell you which angel here very clearly, because it says the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. Who redeems Yeshua, Jesus? It's the blood of Yeshua, Jesus, that redeems us. Now, again, our triune God is three in one. But we don't say that God redeemed us. We don't say the Holy Spirit redeemed us. We give that um, that job, I don't like that word, that, that, gift. Gift. that gift, yeah. the assignment, ability. <laughs> ability, okay, to the Son because he had to become flesh to save flesh. God the Father didn't become flesh. God the Holy Spirit didn't become flesh. So that's why we can very much single out seeing that that third phrase is referring to the son, the son who became the kinsman redeemer, the son who became the Joel from our Hebrew. And we've gone into studies on all this, so I know I'm hitting highlights, but just reminding you, and that's all the more why I look at the position of the shepherd in this verse as referring to the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, guiding him, even as the Holy Spirit guides us today. Uh, you also 19, uh, can you explain it? Uh, we haven't gotten to 19 yet. I'll be glad to explain it when we're there. <laughs> but back here now, seeing the triunity, seeing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now notice, how many verbs, how many actions are we seeing for these three? We see it, three descriptions given all tied to one verb because the three are one. So the God, the Father, the God, the Son, or the Holy Spirit, the God, the Son, he's asking all three singly, bless the lads, bless my kids, bless my family. You remind me, I don't think I put mine on silent today. <laughs> no, I have. Okay. Thank you. And mine will go off in one more minute. You're ahead of me. And, and I can't totally silence mine, so I totally get it. <laughs> and we do want to pray for the release of hostages. I failed to in our prayer earlier. But even now, we're, we call on the triune God to miraculously protect them and bring them out. I would love to see such a miracle happen that the whole world has to say. Healing. And healing for it. Not only the hostages, their families. Israel's got a lot of emotional healing that's going to need to take place. And in that, they need the spirit, they need the son, and they need the father. So that here again, coming back into where we are, he is asking all three as a one, bless my lads. Bless them. How does he want them blessed? May my name live on in them. What you've done for me, Lord, continue it on in their lives. He's giving total credit to his father. May my name live on in them and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Yitzhak. He wants the grace, the salvation, everything he's seen. As he looks back at his grandfather and his father, he wants that to continue on. This is a spiritual prayer. This is not physical here at this point. This is spiritual. That's what matters the most to him is he is wanting to see his family blessed spiritually, have that walking relationship with this God who has personified himself in three ways. 
Um, and may they grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. There's your physical. Bless them in one way they can be blessed, Lord, because we know all parents want that, well, not all, but mostly all, <laughs> want to see themselves have children, have their children blessed, and go on. But having a large family, children are a blessing from the Lord in Scripture. Absolutely. Anybody who doesn't feel that way, there's something wrong because God says children are a gift from the Lord. They are the, the parents' heritage. So with that in mind, we move on to when Yosef saw that his father had laid his right hand on Ephraim's head. It displeased him and he grasped his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Menashe's head. We did talk about that extensively last week, so just real quickly, the right hand was a hand of strength. That was the hand that, uh, and I just realized I didn't talk about nations, but I did last week. Jacob prayed for them to, to become nations, and they did. We've got 10 northern tribes that are, are uh, the, the nations out of one, and we've got the two southern out of the other. We know that they um, grew immensely. They fulfilled what um, Jacob had prayed for them. I'm looking quick through my notes, but we did cover that last week, I believe. I hope we did. I'll, if I review the video and find out we didn't, I'll come back and do it in detail. But now, um, as I'm going on, we talked about the right hand being the hand of strength. We talked about it was the hand of skill. It was a favored position that uh, it, it, the right hand of fellowship, we even say in our day and age with believers, but all the way back here, <clears throat> we see that we went into the scriptures with that also. So when his father has the right hand on the younger son and not the older, Joseph thinks something's out of order. And so that's what it means when he says, you know, he was displeased with it. It wasn't that he favored one son more than another, <clears throat> excuse me, but we just know birthright blessings are a greater blessing that go on the eldest. They get double the portion, but they also have double the responsibility, and they are to be the spiritual head of the family, the whole family clan, as it goes on down. So Yosef is seeing that his father's got the hands mixed up, and remember, his father was almost blind, so he thinks this happened accidentally. Yes. However, we can tell it was on purpose. Absolutely. Because he crossed his hand. Yes. And yes. so even if you can't see good, you're doing something by crossing your hands. Yes. And he corrects his son. He tells him, hey, I know what I'm doing. That comes in our next verse because his father refused and said, I know my son. So, yes, his actions showed it and his words backed up his actions. Yes, Dora. Uh, but why did it become like, like a surprise to Joseph, because he's the second yeah. son. He got yeah. But and the he normal is for the first son to get it. So unless you have something like Jacob and Esau, who God told Rebecca before they were ever born, the younger will receive it. Unless you have something specifically telling you that, we don't read in Scripture that God said Ephraim is going to receive the blessing above the shape. So because he's just expecting it to go in the um, normal order he's expecting it to go to his son Manashe and he just he wants things done right and properly so oops dad you know wait a minute you've got it wrong here and his dad saying no 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 I know what I'm doing and he lets him know that the older sins can be blessed also <clears throat> excuse me he says that uh, he also will become a people and he also will be great however his younger brother shall be greater than he and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So the greater promise is going to the younger, is going to Ephraim. And Ephraim, when I talk about the nations, then, um, he, he does, we do see him in that preeminence. We see him in the greater numbers. He became the representative of the king of Israel, distinct from Judah, from Judah. We see in Hosea, Hosea, and maybe we didn't do this last time. So let's look at Hosea real quick. Um, bless his heart. What a, a man he was. Uh, chapter 5. Hosea, Hoshea in my Hebrew. Hosea chapter 5. If you don't know the background very quickly, Hosea is told to marry a certain woman. She does not stay faithful. She goes out and she comes back. She goes out and she comes back. And Hosea asks what he should do. And God says, bring her back bring her back, bring her back, the forgiveness to continually be there. And it's a picture for the, the um, people who turn their backs on the Lord, even after they've come into the right relationship with him, and they stray, 
and he brings them back. He never says, nope, you can't come back. So this is a greater picture. The Hosea, Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom when it went into captivity even. And throughout the book, Israel is referred to as a prime, as Ephraim, the younger son here. Because that's the name that was predominant for that area, for the, the, those northern tribes. Um, we see that that name becomes dominant after the days of Jeroboam, if you're familiar with the kings. If you're not, that's 1 Kings chapter 12, 19 through 25. We won't read all of that right now, but you'll see. I'm just, what I'm telling you, you'll read in those verses. I just want you to be able to back up what you're hearing. Jeroboam was from Ephraim. He was his ancestor, yeah, not ancestor, his uh, progeny. His, you know, he came from his seed, from his line. <clears throat> and we see, like I said, there's a time when the northern splits from the southern. We have northern Israel. We have southern. Northern is represented by Ephraim, by Ephraim. Okay. Now, even as you just asked me just a moment ago, often, well, I, I can't say often, at times, in scripture, we do see God bypass the older son. We've seen it a number of times here in Genesis. That's why I started to say often, but by the time you go through all of the, the Torah, the scriptures, you don't see it 99 times out of 100. So I can't say, you know, it's not the predominant. But here in the book of Genesis, we have seen Isaac instead of Ishmael. Ishmael was older, but he was not the son of promise. God bypassed him. Isaac, Yitzhak was the choice. Then we already talked about Jacob and Esau, Jacob and Esau. Jacob was the younger, the blessing went to him, not to Esau. And then we've already seen, but we'll see even more. Reuben, the oldest, is going to be uh, moved out of that place of birthright. And we see that it's going to be Ephraim and Monashek. How do we have to? Stay with me. We'll see it as we go through it. Um, but what we see is God is not choosing according to chronology or whatever I should call it, that timeline. He's not seeing and saying just because this one is older, that he's looking for the spiritual to be killed. He's looking for the heart. And we know with each one of these, Ishmael did not have the heart. We know that Esau did not have the heart. We know Reuben was disqualified because he showed what was in his mind and his heart. And here we're seeing also that Yosef is the one who really is receiving the birthright through his sons. It's his sons that, that get it, but the two come in as Joseph. They become, remember Jacob called them my sons. He took them in on that level. They're not his grandsons now. He brought them in on that level. And Yosef, being the firstborn of Rachel, Rachel, we see even God honoring the firstborn because remember, Yaakov did not choose to marry Leah. He got caught in a scheme and she became his wife and she had the firstborn. She had several before Rachel, Rachel ever did. But the firstborn of the one that he truly loved was Yosef. And had it been the plan that he had, Yosef would have been his one who would have received his birthright. So I see God's hand at that. Because, again, God's watching the spiritual, and we all know the heart of Yosef and the difference. And now his sons, by being brought in, we see, obviously, they're not, even though they're half Egyptian, they are not going off in Egyptian idolatry. They're not going into the ways of the world. They are staying with the God of Israel. They're staying with the God of their father, who has taught them the God of his father and his father and his father. So we see God at work spiritually. We see that the preeminence is given to the spiritual rather than the first out of the womb. Okay, and we can see that also as position. When you see this position, then we even see Yeshua because he was born in flesh, yes. But it wasn't that, and I, I've got to say it right because I don't want you to, to get the idea. Yeshua, and I know you, you know better, but Yeshua was not created. Yeshua always existed. All the way back in eternity past, all the way back with Yehovah and the Ruch Kodesh is Yeshua. In that becoming the son, the first begotten of God, when you read those words, that's talking about <laughs> rank, that's talking about position. And even Yeshua, who is the creator of everything, is moved into that first place position. He had the highest rank 
in that position, talking about him from a human perspective. Okay, I don't want anybody to think, go away and think she's saying that Yeshua in his original was born. Yeshua is God. God was never born. So, uh, but it's amazing. It's amazing how we see God's hand move. And when you think how, well, I'm ahead because I'm studying it. Chapter 49, when you see how far reaching that prophecy is going to be, how anyone, I can't tell you and make it happen a week from now. I could tell you what I think might happen a week from now, and it may or it may not, but I certainly will not make it or not make it happen. Try that for a, a year. Try it for 40 years. Try it for a century. Try it for thousands of years. Try it for the eternity of time. Wow, what a God. Every detail, every dot, I dot, T crossed, every jot and tittle in the Hebrew, okay? <laughs> every way, it is amazing. So when we go back to Genesis 48, we see that, that Jacob has put his faith in this magnificent God who he does believe has everything in control. And he's wanting that blessing to come down onto his children. No better way can you as parents bless your children than to bless them in the spiritual ways, to pray for the spiritual blessings to be upon them. It's not so much a matter of whether they make a name for themselves or whether they have riches or whatever the, you think matters in this world. Take all that, strip that away, and what matters is that heart spiritually and the walk with their God. So he's asking God to bless them in this way. He is now bringing the blessing upon the one that God is directing him. God's the one that told Yaakov to cross his hands. God is the one that, that was saying prophetically through Yaakov, Ephraim would become the greater. Now that was a long shot. There wasn't any reason to believe that except God was saying, it, and that's why we knew, and we knew that it would be. We'll talk more about that as we get into the prophetic uh, chapter that's coming. Um, and shall, uh, the both shall become a multitude of nations. I think I've said that. So he blessed them that day, verse 20, saying, by you, Israel, um, by you, Israel, will pronounce blessings, saying, okay, Israel, remember, is Yaakov's spiritual name. So as Yaakov is in the spirit, spiritually speaking, spiritually being, bringing that blessing, then he is saying, may God make you like Ephraim and Manashe, that they're, they're going to say even, let that always be said. So here what he's saying is he's bringing the blessing for the two sons in a form of a benediction that's going to be carried on down through the time with Israel that others will be saying, may you be blessed like a friend in Manashe, because they're seeing the hand of blessing. They're seeing what that meant from the hand of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Those three, remember the, the Father covenant relationship, the Son salvation relationship, and the Ruch HaKodesh, the spiritual growth relationship. That's the blessing you'd want to see on your children and your children's children and down through the nation. So he's giving them a beautiful blessing, a beautiful spiritual blessing. And it, to just make it clear, it's like kind of putting the, the final sentence on it in the period. He says, and he put Ephraim before Manashe. He chose the younger over the older. Just, you know, making sure we got it clear. That's the order according to the Lord. The last shall be first. Good. That's very good. Okay, verse 21. Then Israel, Jacob, okay, I, I want to separate, make sure you're not thinking nation. Then Israel, the person, spiritually minded, said to Yosef, behold, I'm about to die. And it's hard to let go. I don't know about you, but I fall in love with the characters as I'm studying them. And it's hard to let go, but I know how exciting it is to know one day we'll all get to meet him face to face. Don't you want to sit down and ask him a few questions? I do. <laughs> and I want to meet his wife, wife Rachel, because of my name. <laughs> if you wonder where my name came from, you just got a big hint. <laughs> so then Israel said to Yosef, Behold, I'm about to die. But God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. 
he knew his tongue was imminent. He's not crying in his teacup and he's not saying it when he's going to live, you know, hundreds of years longer. He really knew time is drawing to now and he's, he's encouraging his son. God's going to be with you. You know, he is being a good spiritual father. Let me encourage you. Let me remind you, it is God who is walking with you. God's not dying on you. I'm the one that's dying on you. God be with you. Bring you back to the land of your fathers. That was Jacob's faith. Remember when he had to go down into Egypt? We saw that he stopped and he paused where there was an altar. And we believe that he was praying and saying, is this right? Because he knew before they were told not to leave the land of promise. Even his father, Isaac, was not to leave the land of promise. And God assured him at that time, yes, you are to go. You go down. You will see your son. You will die in his presence. And your son, they will come back. They will be brought back into the land of promise. So he took God at his word. He went down and he saw his son eye to eye. He knows he's dying. And where is he dying? In the presence of his earthly son. So he knows it's exactly how God said. Part one, part two. He knows part three is going to happen also. You're going to go back to the land. And he's assuring them and encouraging them you're, that you will go back to the land of your fathers. Now, Joseph himself did return. Let's take a sneak peek. Go to chapter 50 real quick. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 50. You can probably get there faster than I can on my tablet. Genesis chapter 50. And we're going to look at verse uh, oh, where did I want? 7. That's what I thought. Thank you. Verse 7. So Joseph, Joseph went up to bury his father, Jacob, and went and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. So he had a whole entourage go with him, but they went up from Egypt back into the land of Israel. So Joseph literally did return to Israel. Now he didn't return to stay. We've still got you know everything that's going on, the famine that's still continuing. And God, well, no, I guess the family isn't by now, but still, God, God's not telling Joseph to go live back home, but he did take his father's remains and he buried them there. Look also with me at Joshua, Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24, <clears throat> excuse me, and verse 32. Joshua, Joshua 30, 24, 32, where we read, now they buried the bones of Joseph. Okay, we're just now burying the bones of Jacob. His son Joseph has now also died. And where does he get buried? In verse 32. Now they buried the bones of Joseph, which the sons of Israel brought up from Egypt at Shechem in the piece of ground, which Jacob, Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money. And it became the inheritance of Joseph's sons. Who are Joseph's sons? Ephraim and Manashe. They've got rights to that land where they're burying their father, Yosef. That's going to be part of their territory when we get into Yahshua and they go into the promised land and it's divided among the nation, the, the tribes, we'll see that that's where their, their portion of land was. So Jacob gets returned, Joseph gets returned in death, in burial, but they also, uh, that was their primary home. They got to, to have their bones carried back home. How many years did Joseph die and his father already they buried him? How many more years did, he, did Joseph live? Uh, it was a number of years. Um, do I remember how old Joseph was um, when he died? I can get that for you. I, somebody can even Google fast if they want it before the end of class. Otherwise, because my brain doesn't hold on to everything, We'll get you how old was Joseph when Jacob died, when he died. and when then he when he died, and that'll tell us, but it's it's quite a while still, quite a while. Yeah, not a short time by any means. Um, anyone want to Google, go ahead. I I would love to remember. God, half my re remembrances <laughs> remember. <laughs> how do I say that? Then we can get that answer for you. Um, either before class ends or I'll add it on in the video next time. Okay, so going back to Bereshit, going back to Genesis now, he he knows that everything's been done that needs to be done. He knows that 
He's about to die. He, he knows that his family is going to go back to Israel. In verse 22, he says, I give you, speaking to Yosef, I give you one portion more than your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. Okay, one portion above the brothers is very fitting with the birthright. I'm sorry? 37 years ago. 37 years difference. Thank you. Okay, so 37 years more that Joseph's going on with. Okay, yeah. I knew it was long. Thank you. It's good to have it when we're asking the question. So thank you very much. Okay, so what does it mean one more portion of that? Remember the birthright? The oldest who's receiving that birthright would get double the portion of land because he was also going to be the one to take care of the mother if she's widowed, take care of any unmarried um, daughters that are his sisters. He had a lot more responsibility. He would be taking care of the servants. Whatever blessings they had would be his responsibility. So he was always given double the portion in the, the land also. <clears throat> so that's what Jacob is doing. He's giving his son, the first son of Rahel, but not his firstborn, that he's giving him that promise and that fulfillment. And he gave him a specific area, a, a territory that he said he acquired from Hamor. Okay? Look back because it's been too long ago for us. Look back at Genesis 33. There is sheet 33. Genesis chapter 33, and we're going to look at verses 18 and 19. And there we read, Now Yaakov came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Canaan Aram and camped before the city. He bought the piece of land where he pitched his camp from the hand of the sons of Hamar. Is that not what we were just reading? This is the portion. He's saying this is your extra portion, uh, Joseph. This portion that I bought back then, I bought it for a hundred pieces of money from Shechem's father, Hamor, and he erected an altar there and called it El Elohe Israel, God, the God of Israel. So um, that was a special land to him. He bought it. He, he had the rights to it. He's passing it now down to his son, uh, to his, the son of choice, Joseph. Joshua, Yeshua, I should have told you to stay there a moment ago, chapter 24 and verse 32. Heck, we just read that. We did. We just read that. And and it was also, well, that's that's giving you, now they buried the bones of Yosef, the sons of Israel brought up from Egypt at Shechem in the piece of ground which Jacob had bought. So we just see the whole connection. He had bought it, and here he is burying him there. Now, just to show you the continuity through Scripture, let me run you over to John real quickly, Yochanan in the Brita Hadashah. John chapter 4, and we're just going to look at one verse real quickly, but it's very interesting what it says in description. This is the woman at the well, if you're familiar with the story, and it says, So he, Yeshua, came to the city of Samaria, called Sakar, near the parcel of ground that Yaakov gave to his son Joseph. It spells it out. This is the, the parcel, this is the area that I gave, or Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And we even see later, we know that she came to Jacob's well. She says, it's the well of my forefather, Yaakov, Jacob. So scripture continues to tell you the story and it never contradicts itself. So what's interesting though, is the description given us in chapter 48, that he took it from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. There's no mention of this occasion in scripture. We don't hear about this battle. What it could be, because we know that that Yaakov bought a parcel. We know that he bought that specific area. It could be that when he had left Shechem, that later the Amorites were, had taken over in this area and he had to fight for it. And in that fight, he maybe even got more of that area. Don't know, but that's the closest we can get. I can tell you, and I want to tell you this because it'll help you when you, we get into chapter 49. When you look in Hebrew, they have different tenses. English is past, present, and future. Okay, we're, we're, that's it. We've got three. Greek's got six. I don't remember how many Hebrew has, but Hebrew has a perfect tense. And when it's used prophetically, it speaks as if what's going to happen in the future is already done. That's the way God looks at our salvation. He sees us as already saved. He sees everything completed. He sees it finished. 
So it could also be that looking at it in that way, that um, prophetically, Yaakov would wrestle for this land from the Amorites in the future. It wouldn't be actually Jacob, it would be his children that is in his line, so it's credited into him in that same way, and that God was foretelling and giving credit as if done. Okay, that could be. I'm not saying it has to be that way, but that's the closest we can get when we know that when Israel under Yahshua went into Canaan, and I, I'm saying the nation Israel went into the land of Canaan, that it's at that time that, that they were fighting against the Can Canaanites, Canaanites, and fighting other nations also. We read of the battle with the Amorites there. We don't read of the battle back here in Yaakov's line. So I tend to think that's what it is. It's the Hebrew tense prophetically looking for it and giving credit here as if that, and it is that area that we do know Yaakov did buy that portion of land the same way Abraham bought the cave of Machpelah and the field that was connected with it. And in that way, we know Abraham and Isaac and their wives and Jacob and Leah are buried, that Joseph's buried over here, okay? And Quick did, question for you. Yes. Did you want the ages of... Sure, if you've got the ages too. We know it's 37 years apart. Now, go ahead. Okay, so um, I looked it up on um, biblestudy.org. Very good. And apparently, Jacob died when he was 147. That's what I thought. And okay. at that time, Joseph was 56. Okay, okay. And then Joseph went on Which to, is live right. yes. to be 110. Okay, uh, yeah, 110 clicks now. And his whole time that he reigned in um, Egypt was literally 80 years. Okay, and we do see that the difference does fit oh, with what you were telling us also. How long did he live? He lived 110, and he was 56. So we've got a little longer than what we said a, a few moments ago. But I know those, it rings the bell. I remember that, um, that the ages there. So you do have, because remember, Yosef was uh, 39 when he went into reign um, in, in Egypt. Um, and then we had the years of famine. I mean, the years of plenty, two years of famine before um, Joseph came down before Jacob came down. Forgive my poor brain. <laughs> I don't want to confuse you all, but it does fit. So we've got that. Joseph was 110 when he died. He was 56 at this point, um, with Yaakov dying, who died at 147. Okay? We're beginning to see a little shortening of life, too, because the patriarchs, you know, the further back they go, the longer they live. Of course, major change with Noah's flood. That's when they all came to me after if he died in 110, that means from that time on, everybody didn't live like Jacob and all them. They didn't live the hundreds of years. But we do see that when we went through the chapter, and I don't remember which one in Genesis now, where we looked at all those, those in the genealogy, we saw some lived a lot of 300 years, some lived, you know, some gave birth at 60 years of age, and some were giving birth at 100 and plus years of age. But we saw, you know, quite a range but overall we see the shortening the adult yeah. was 900 years yes and methuselah was 969 they're the oldest yes and then you have by the time the psalmist is speaking and the psalmist giving them a um, demand to live four score and ten years yeah. which did i said right 70 years he has given a man to live 70 years and if he's strong 10 more which is the 80 years boy my brain did it <laughs> my brain is you're over blessed, today. You're blessed. Come on. Like your word. You're blessed. Oh, it's blessed. I just want it blessed even more. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And Moshe, when he died, it was at the hand of God. When he died, it wasn't that it was old age. His eyes weren't dim. But God had said, you know, he was not going to go into the promised land. And he went up the mountain with God. And then Yahshua took over. So yes, yes. In this case, we saw Israel's eyes were dim. We know his father's eyes were dim. His father is showing it spiritually, Jacob not being the same case. And then yet you've got Moshe with the, the eyes that we're still seeing so well. So just like we see today, different, different people. It's not a matter of, well, that one's more religious. That one's more spiritual. So that one doesn't have these issues. No, 
I wish it worked that way because then we could all really plug in the Lord and see those blessings overflow. But at the same time, even the Lord says, blessed in his eyes is the death of his saints. How could that be a blessing? He's bringing them home out of this and into his presence. Hallelujah. I'll take it. I'll you know, find out. Really great. <laughs> it's on my mother's side. Their their synagogue uh, preachers, they all live up to 90 to 100, 105. Wow. Okay, cool. All right. Let me see if they did everything. Genesis 15, 16 tells us. Let me take it back into our context. So we go back to um, 48. Um, okay. Because remember, we're talking about how they'll go back up to the land of Israel. So in that context, remember that Genesis 15, 16 indicated to us that they would be down in Egypt for a long time. Anyone remember how long? 400 years. 400 years. Very good. 400 years. Yes. So it wasn't going to happen in Jacob's lifetime. He's not going to live to 400. It's not going to happen in Joseph. Even combining those two, we don't come to 400 years. It's We've got to go down past them to their children's children that will um, be the ones that are blessed to go back into the land. Let's look at Joshua, Joshua chapter 5 and verse 1 in relation to that. Joshua chapter 5 and verse 1. Now it came about when all the king... Oh, that's, I, I should have brought that verse out earlier, sorry. But still, my proof for the Amorites battling the Amorites. It came about when all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard how the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan before the sons of Israel till they crossed that their hearts melted and there was no spirit any longer in them because of the sons of Israel. What that's saying is as Joshua coming into the land, they had that time when he told the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, step into the waters of the Jordan and it'll split. And whether it split this way or split this way, we know that they, the, the Ark of the Covenant didn't get wet and it didn't get drowned and they didn't get drowned and they, everybody crossed the, the Jordan River, much like the miracle that we know of the Red Sea. Well, what it's saying is, those living in the land, the Amorites in particular, they heard about that. Now here come those sons of Israel, and they're in a panic. It's like, oh, no, their God's more powerful than us. So they, they were in fear. What verse is that? That's Joshua chapter 5 and verse 1. And I apologize that I didn't bring that out earlier when we were talking about it. I'm slightly out of order, but we're still close enough. You remember my mentioning it. And it is in your cross-references if you have them. Joshua 10 and verse 5 also. So the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron. And remember, all those kings are like mayors. It doesn't mean king of England. The whole that they were like mayors over cities. Um, all these kings, the king of Yarmouth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon gathered together and went up all their armies and they camped by Gibeon and fought against them. So here's your battle. But the battle belongs to the Lord. And what the Lord says is what will happen. Yeshua, Joshua chapter 12 and verse 2. We have Sion, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon and ruled from Aurora, I don't know how to say it, which is on the edge of the valley of Arnon, both the middle of the valley and the half of God, even as far as the group Yavok, the border of the sons of Ammon. So there he was, and he goes away because children of Israel capture the land. So again, when it's saying that Jacob did it, it's Jacob's sons that did it, actually sons' sons, because it's in the time of Yahshua that they go in. So whichever way you want to look at it, speaking prophetically as if done, or giving credit because of the family name, whichever way God is faithful to his word, and it was through that line, bless you, that they got this land and that phrase in Genesis 48, as we go back to it, that says it was with my sword and my bow, that does mean it was done in battle. It was a fierce battle. It was forcefully taken. And that's the portion that is gifted to Joseph in the future. Yes. Okay? Perfect tense. Perfect tense. Hebrew, the perfect tense. Yes. So any questions before we move or comments before we move into chapter 49? Okay, here is our prophecy, and it's in poetic form. That means it's in imagery. Let's try that word again. 
Im imagery, okay, I gotta get my R in the right place, is, is picture form, is images, okay? We're gonna read and understand what those mean as we break it down and we study it. And this is Yaakov's deathbed message, okay? He knows he's dying and he's going to prophetically speak over each one of his sons. Now, let me just put it in a personal perspective. In uh, my family, going back a number of years, on my mom's side, there were four of us that were um, spiritually connected, and we were the prayer partners for our family. Two lived up north, two lived down here. My mom and I being the two down here, my cousin Edie and my aunt Leona being the ones that lived up in Northern California, and the family was in both locations. So anytime something happened with the north, they let the south know, and the south let the north know, and we'd stay connected and we prayed. One by one, my Aunt Leona goes to heaven first, then my mom goes to heaven, and Edie and I were still prayer partners, and very, very close prayer partners, and she knew she was not. She took advantage of that because she was a spiritual head and glue of the family in the North, and she wanted one last time with each of her family members. So she told them all, she got the word out, I'm dying, I know I will die in the morning, you all, you to come to my hospital room. And she didn't take no's for an answer. <laughs> the ones that lived too far, like I was too far, she got on the phone with. So she literally talked to every family member in this immediate family, cousins and so forth, not, not 50 people out, but there were a number of us. All over her her, her, her um, how you say it in English? She is brave, okay? Yeah. Her boldness. boldness, her boldness in the Lord. And she taught to each one, taught to their heart spiritually. The ones that weren't living right, she told them, you need to get right with the Lord. And she just she just laid it out because these were her final words to them. And those like me who were spiritually minded, she knew that before long, I'd want to pick up that phone because of a prayer need and I'd want to be talking to my prayer partner. And she realized, you know, there's not someone there to step into her shoes. And I love her words to me. It took them to heart, and to this day, they still touch my heart. And she said, Michelle, when you want to reach out and you want to talk to me on the phone, you just picture me in that cloud of witnesses. And I'm going to be up there, and you're going to be saying, go, Michelle, go, go, Michelle, go. You can do it. You can do it. <laughs> and there are so many times the Lord brings that back to my remembrance, and it is the spiritual lift she wanted it to be. I was very blessed by her last words. That's just a personal note to take this into this chapter. Yaakov spiritually wants to bless, wants to pour into each one. He's really feeling the responsibility, and he's wanting to touch them. And he's going to tell them as it is. So we've got in this chapter the ones that aren't right, the ones that are not living under the Lord, the ones that are out of line. He says it. He calls it what it is. And he tells them, lost because of it or whatever. You know, he doesn't let them off the hook any more than my cousin left her family loved ones off the hook. And at the same time, those who are spiritually in that right and being will be receiving blessing, he brings it out very clearly too. So I hope that puts a little personal picture on it because once again these were real people they had their ups and downs they had their good days and their bad days they had the times when they were closer to the lord and sadly further from the lord and encouragement for us is we need to be close to the lord we need to be right before the lord daily we don't know when our last day will be and we don't want to go out in a position of unfaithfulness to our lord we want to go out faithfully serving so I just want to encourage you in that. Let's look and see now what Yaakov said to his sons. He summons them all, and they know to come. They know this is it. This isn't, like I say, he's not crying wolf. This is going to be it. So he summons them. He calls them all. He says, assemble yourselves that I may tell you what will befall you. Okay, I want to tell you what's going to come. But notice the phrase he uses. He doesn't say what's going to happen tomorrow. He says right here and lays it out, and we know he's speaking by the power of God that it's going to be what will befall you in the days to come. In our Hebrew, that's akari hayamin, in the last days. 
This is the first time this expression is being used in the Bible. It's speaking of Israel's history. These are days that are still coming. We're going to see with some of the sons we see fulfillment or partial fulfillment that we're going to see we're still waiting for total fulfillment in all, you know, it, not in every single son, but overall. We don't, have not seen the completion of the prophecies of Genesis 49. But just as I introduced you to that Hebrew tense, God calls it as if death, and it will be death, exactly as he called it. Amazing, amazing. Only God can do that. Only God. So he's going to call, he's called together, he's going to go through with them in order. In verse two, he says, gather together and hear. Listen. I can I can hear it, behold there, even though scripture doesn't have it, but he's, he's pay attention. These are my parting words. You need to listen to these words. And notice how he says it. He says, and I've lost my place. There we go. Listen to Israel, your father. Okay, now he called the sons of Jacob. When he called them the sons of Jacob, the sons of Jacob, he's talking about the physical seed. You're literally my physical sons. But now he's talking to them as Israel, not as just your earthly father. He's talking to them as the spiritual man that he had become, the spiritual father. And this will now be the first time that we see in scripture where declared prophecy is coming through a man. Prophecies that we've had before have either been veiled or they've been by God. This is the first time that we have a man prophetically speaking the voice of God. So it's uh, very interesting to see how this is forming and coming out. And we know how it goes on through time because we'll have prophets that speak the voice of God, that, that Yaakov is in that first position. So they need to listen to the spiritual father. And here's where he doesn't mince words because he starts right off with Reuben. And Reuben, unfortunately, is not one who lived up to the position he should be in as firstborn. There was a lot of guilt that their dad got through with it. I'm sure there was. Reuben, you are my firstborn. You know that's special. You are my firstborn, my might, my vigor. You're the beginning of my strength. First fruits, often that's used of the firstborn set. Let me give you some other examples in scripture. Go with me to Psalm, to Halim, Psalm 78. Psalm 78 and verse 51. Okay, where we will read, and smote all the firstborn in Egypt. Okay, I've got another. Let me give it to you in King James because, yeah, let me go back to King James because the word I want, I'm not finding in there. And I just closed my tablet. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Technology and Rochelle's fingers, yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to take it away from Genesis and I'm going to have to call it up real quick. Psalm 78. And verse, I forget now, but thank you, 51. My mind is spinning, and honestly, I'm feeling right now the weight of this prophecy is, is just mind-boggling to me. It's just, wow. I mean, there's so much, and I don't want to miss. And so all the firstborn of Egypt, it's, I'm still giving it to you in English. Let's try again. Sorry, folks. Old King James says, the chief of their strength, in the tabernacles of Tom. Okay, the chief of their strength, the beginning of their strength, that's often how it was referred to. Let me give you another example since I didn't do that with Psalm. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 21. What I'm trying to say is um, often when they're the first, they have their firstborn, it's a picture of virility, it's a picture of strength, of might, and that's what he's saying. You are my firstborn. This you know, was might. We're going on. We're being blessed. This, you know, and think back, if, especially if you're a dad, the first time you had a son, how you felt, or maybe I even should just say son, you're firstborn. You feel like, you know, you've accomplished. This is what you're supposed to do in life, and here it is, you know, that idea. Deuteronomy, Dabari, chapter 7, 21 and verse 17, that he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the love, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength. To him belongs the right of the firstborn. That was a law being set down because there were those who had multiple marriages. 
And if there was a, a time, like with Jacob, where one was loved and one was not loved, now I think he grew to love Leah. He shows that in his words um, of, of her death uh, and where he's buried. But if there is a favored one, look at Hagar and Sarah. Of course, Hagar wasn't a wife. Hagar was handmade. But still, we know there was there could easily be favoritism. And God was laying down the law that if your your wife that you don't love as much has that firstborn, she that firstborn gets the birthright. It doesn't go to the one that you love just because you love that one more and we're going to ignore this one. That's why it's even more apparent it was the hand of God that moved Joseph into that firstborn position because Leah was an unloved, but God did give it to um, Rachel's first. So God can make exception to his rules, and he does for his purposes. But here again, did you notice how it says that uh, he is the beginning of his strength? I've got one. I'm God's blessing me. I'm flat, flat, barrel. How is that? I'll have another. Remember, God had to reinvigorate Abraham, not just Sarah, but Abraham also, to make them be able to have that son of promise. And then Abraham was so reinvigorated, he goes on and has more children with another wife. So he, he came to life and he stayed alive. <laughs> okay, the beginning of strength. And that strength can also mean, and as we go back to Genesis 49, that strength can also mean um, the power that goes along with the household, with the leading position, the, the power that goes with the son who does receive birthright blessing. So that could have been Reuben. So that's what he's saying here um, when he says that, that you were the beginning of my strength and you were preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Okay, you may have, if you've got King James, you may have the word excellency instead of preeminent, but preeminent is a word we understand better, and that's what it's saying. Preeminent, you were in that position. You could have carried in dignity and you could have carried in power. You have you were in that position because you were firstborn. But obviously there's a but coming. Verse four, uncontrolled as water. Or you may have unstable in your version. Uncontrolled, I think, is is even a little better. The Hebrew says it's like boiling water. Now, if you see something boiling over, it boils over, dries up. It doesn't uh, it, it doesn't keep to what it should have been. You lose what boils over. And if you look at water in the sun, boiling hot, it dries up. It, it will dry it up. It also, when it boils over, we can see in the sense that it's difficult to contain. So let's look at the waters that would overflow the banks. You've all seen it when down at the seashore, the waves come in and they take out the houses that were there on the seashore. Nothing can stop that water. It's uncontrollable. It's unstable. It's taken out houses. It, it, the River Nile, it would overflow its banks, and that was the fertile land because it overflowed and watered that area of land. So that's what it's showing is that the, the, it can't be controlled. It can't be stopped where it should be because it can even do damage, and it can be wasted. It can be dried up. It can be lost, and that was his moral condition. He had no self-discipline. How do we know that? Genesis 35, 22, tells us that he went to the bed of his father's handmaid, uh, his mom's handmaid, sorry, his mom's handmaid. Anyway, it was incest. And because of that, it showed he wasn't controllable. He gave in to his lusts. He just did what he felt like doing. He did not keep himself under control. And then we see in First Chronicles, and I'll have you turn to that, First Chronicles 5, verses 1 and 2. First Chronicles 5. This would be 7, That's what I have. Yeah. It should be 5, verses 1 and 2. If I got a 7 in there, I made a mistake. I don't know. Are you in chapter 49, verse 4? On the cross-references? Yeah. Okay, we'll figure it out after class then. We'll make sure you've got a, a right copy. First Chronicles 5, verse 1 says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Yosef, the son of Israel. 
Okay, that's gonna pick up on the video, so I'll wait for a second. Okay, she needs the page is 95 and then we can talk. Okay. Um, yeah, and if not, I'll have to get you another copy later because I only had the one left that I had marked out for her for Cheryl. So okay. Sorry. Um mine does too. Mine is not right either. Yeah, because well. Are you what page are we on, Cheryl? We're supposed to be on page ninety-five. Okay, are you on page ninety-five, Dora? Yeah. Oh, I I yeah. Sorry, folks. Okay, trust me, I'll get that straightened out afterward. Let's just go ahead and make sure we're all on the same page. Chapter 49, verse 4, we're cross-referencing it with First Chronicles 5, verses 1 and 2, that's saying what, what Jacob's saying about his son. The sons, the son, now the sons of Reuben, who is the firstborn of Israel, for he was firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph. All right, he spells it out. You lost it, Reuben. It went to the sons of Yosef. Um, okay. The son of Israel, the son of Jacob. I got it. Jacob's son. Okay, good. Jacob's son, Joseph, is the one who the birthright went to. So that Reuben is not enrolled in the genealogy according to the birthright. We know that. We're being told it now in Genesis 49. By the time we get to Chronicles, which is saying, here's our genealogy, why is Reuben not in this place? Because he defiled his father's bed. So his birthright didn't go to Reuben, it went to Joseph. And the genealogical lines will show Joseph in that firstborn position, even though physically he was not firstborn, but according to God, he is in that position. Verse 2. Though Judah, Judah prevailed over his brothers, and from him came the leader, and we know that's a reference to Messiah, out of the line of Judah comes Messiah, yet the birthright belonged to Joseph, to Joseph. So the, the birthright goes to Joseph and his line. The coming of Messiah will go to Judah's line. We see a separation there, not through the line of the firstborn. God is in control, working it the way God has designated it, the way he declared it would be. So back to Genesis 49, and we read, okay, um, you shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed. Then he defiled it. He went up to my couch. It's just explaining it. It's saying what he had done. Um, let me make sure I told you everything I wanted. Okay, let me give you the fulfillment. We do see for Reuben, his dignity and his glory are completely dried up, just like the scripture said. We don't see from Reuben come any judges. We don't see any kings come from his line, and there are no prophets that come from his line. The privileges of priests, which the firstborn was to be the priest to the family, that even uh, went to Levi's or Levi's sons. So we see nothing in Reuben's line that shows any kind of glory, any kind of preeminence, any kind of, um, what's the other word we use? Um, dignity from his line. And the birthright, again, we've read, goes to the firstborn of Rachel instead of the firstborn of Leah. Reuben was Leah's firstborn. Also, it's interesting, Reuben stayed on the east side of the Jordan. We read that when we get to Numbers chapter 32, Bednabar chapter 32, that Reuben was one of the tribes. It wasn't the only one, but they stayed on the east of the Jordan. They didn't cross over as the others did. Moshe had issue with that, but they came to an agreement. But Reuben also decreased in numerical size because of the sin. The number of men that were able to go up to war in the beginning of Numbers, Numbers chapter 1, verse 21, and then about 40 years later in chapter 26 and verse 7 of Numbers, you go from 46,500 men that could go to war at the beginning, and at that latter count, it was 43,730. So you've got a loss of, of over 3,000 there. You've got a, a big decline even in the size. So we see Reuben shrinking. There's nothing more that, that would give him dignity or glory or strength or power. Um, it's, it's just interesting. Out of Reuben, we see all kinds of problems, almost the civil war. Um, we see in the days of Devorah, Deborah, and Barak, 
that's when the tribe of Reuben failed to answer the call to war, and there was an issue over that. That's in the book of Judges. We read it in Joshua. So just take my word for it. If you don't know Reuben's history, I'm giving it to you in a nutshell. Have you read that? Reuben? Yeah, Reuben. So he didn't melt the death in the end it was his family for a year. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Okay, he would not have preeminence. He would not excel. He wouldn't have anything special to contribute or to leave as a benefit for his posterity. There just wasn't anything there. His glory and his dignity were dried up, just like uh, Jacob had said would be. So that's one of the prophecies we can see already fulfilled, although, as Jacob said it, it was still prophetic at that time. Remember, we're going to be looking at, because we're 2024, we're going to be looking at past history, present history, and future history. I but, would not want to live in that kind of house with all those women fighting and boys and all this. I agree. Mm. I don't want to live in that kind of house. Yes. <laughs> I don't want to live in that kind of house. Yes. I'm sure it wasn't too peaceful. <laughs> okay, so what happens with the next ones? Because Reuben was first born. What about Shimon or Simeon, as you say, and Levi or Levi, Levi however you pronounce it? These are verses five through eight. Okay, now notice it's interesting. Shimon and Levi or Levi are brothers. Well, wait a minute, Jacob. Mother. All 12 are brothers. <laughs> But these two, we see often in scripture, there was a closeness between these two. So I think that's what it's meaning here, that they were the closest companions among the brothers. They were always in cahoots together. They One would get the other, and they'd go do their gastrophy deeds often. Okay, They were brethren in thought, apparently, and in action, carrying out the thoughts as they saw them. And notice what kind of thoughts they, they were thinking and what they were carrying out, because it says to hear, it says to us here in verse 5, their swords are implements of violence, okay? Or you may have that they had instruments of cruelty, um, even uses the word habitation. It was a habit for them. Their habits were cruel. They were violent. They were not when kind. When they killed all those men, yes. they, 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 they defended yeah. their sister, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. They defended their sister, but look in the way they defended her. They didn't, wow. and, and let me give you, sorry, I'm going political for a minute. We'll, one minute, we'll get right back on, okay? <laughs> but I just have to say it. Israel took out two leaders in the last 24 hours. Yeah. No, yes. One major leader of Hamas, one major leader of Hezbollah. The fact that she took one out all the way in Tehran shows you. Everybody who's saying Israel is weak and wimpy, hello, with God on her side, little David just took down Goliath, okay? But here's my point. Israel warned that there was going to be retaliation for the sake of the video. If you do not know, 12 children playing on a soccer field were killed by a Hezbollah rocket. Even though Hezbollah wants to deny it, their fingerprints are all over that rocket. Israel knows who and Israel knew where the rocket came from and Israel knew who sent the rocket. How did okay? they find it, that leader that just because it, God has given Israel an ability to, to learn where their enemy is for their defense. Okay? It's God. Is and God protecting us? The they know where a lot of the other yes. leaders are. Yes, and, and, and it was even given to us, which is more than Israel usually says. A few days ago, it was yeah. said the cabinet decided what was going to be done. They gave Netanyahu the, yep, yeah, go ahead. And he just said it's a matter of when. And here's where I'm showing you the example Israel said, we will retaliate, but we're waiting for the moment when there won't be loss of innocent life. Because they knew in that crossfire there could come in innocent women, innocent children. These were innocent children playing on a soccer field. They were not an enemy and a threat to Hezbollah. They were just simply living their simple little lives playing. Israel didn't say, okay, we're going to go take 12 of your children. Israel values life. And that's the problem why Israel does not have a peace partner and cannot sit down at the table and negotiate peace. Because Israel values life. Yeah. And the Arab enemy, not all Arabs, the enemy, Hezbollah, Hamas, the, the Houthis, the ones that are literally the terrorists, they do not value life. They use life to protect themselves. They use the children as their shields. They use the, the, the women as their pawns. 
So Israel needed to retaliate. She cannot let this go. If she didn't do anything, they'd hit again. They'd kill again. And they'd kill cult. again. I'm sorry? They're called the death cult. Death cult. Yeah, that fits them well. Yeah, so Israel had to retaliate. But here's where she didn't go after everybody and all the innocent. This is what I see that the two boys did. This is yeah. what Shimon and Levi, or Shimon especially, I'm sorry, I think it is, was Jacinda at this time. But when he went after the Shechemites, a lot of innocent men, they, they pulled them into a false sense of security. They were tricking them and deceiving them, and they took innocent lives. God does not say, oh, that's okay because you're Israel. No, God requires Israel to live to a higher standard even. And so he deals heavily with the hand with his hand on Shimon. We're going to see that in these next verses. And that's where I'm telling you, when people say it wasn't right for Israel, what was she doing shooting all the way up into Tehran? Hello. This one not only did took out these 12, this one was also responsible for our 240 uh, uh, military that lost their lives in 93, was it? Way back, yeah. the military base? Beirut. Yes, the Beirut military base. He was, yeah. he instigated that. And it, the, the list of all in the innocent that he had killed through the years, they took out a terrorist. They took out one who is evil personified. They didn't go after an innocent. Shimon? Okay, yes, Dina needed to be vindicated. But not in the way we did it. Okay, so and a political lesson, but because people don't understand, and you will hear rhetoric, sadly, even in our own country against Israel for doing this. Now Israel's escalating the war because now they'll feel like they have to hit back. It's Israel's fault. Go back to the where did it start? Go back to the evil that initiated it, and then look at how Israel chooses carefully to recap. And and Israel is only going after the leaders? Yes, exactly. That's my point. They're, Not yeah, after the they're, innocent. They're going after the ones that are calling the shots, that are right. doing, that are deciding that kind of Right, thing. right. And if you take out that head that's masterminding and planning it, then how many more plans are just going to crumble that were on the table and that would have come in the future? Thank God. So that head has been gone. It's been torn out. Oh, like absolutely. 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 Oh. Yes, yes. Did you have a comment, question? Well, I just wanted to sideline, you know, because you were saying about how great God is, you know, in the Olympics, I don't know if everybody's following. Uh, I think it was just like swimming. Uh, this this Muslim guy, he, he won. And he gets up there and says, it's a liar, this, that, the other one. Well, and then for the next time, he got hurt somewhere along the line, and he, he can't compete anymore. <laughs> so, so I yeah. had not heard that. <laughs> If you did not hear, she's saying that a Muslim won a race and was saying, all is good, all is good. In his next race, he got no, hurt. Else but a lion. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. And he got hurt and he can't run anymore. And she's she's saying poetic justice there, too. Swimming. Oh, swimming. Okay, sorry. Sorry. I, I didn't that. hear. But anyway, interesting. Sure. Interesting. God is it. Yes, yes. And Allah is not God's equal opposite. Allah is a name, a cover name for Satan, who is not Satan, who is not God's equal opposite. Satan was a created being. He is evil personified. He's working in the hearts of evil. Allah literally means moon god. It started out with the worship of the moon god. That's who they're still worshiping is, is Satan, who it's just using different names I to get the... That's why. That's why. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It clicks, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Okay, so they are implements of violence. They're, are, are you okay? <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, Hebrew says that their tools of violence are their weapons. So they're choosing violence. That's what they're doing. That's from Genesis 34, 25, the, the, when they went after the Shechemites and, um, massacred the whole all the people they manifested anger and cruelty known as men of violence uncontrolled anger and fury and it's very interesting that they're the only tribe not mentioned in the blessing from Moshe when Moses blesses the tribes in Deuteronomy chapter 33 
they're not mentioned. Um, and later they settle outside of the boundaries of the Holy Land. So it's like they just never quite get 100% on the right page. They're just always a little out in left field, the, forgive me, black sheep of the family. <laughs> okay, not the best expression, but you get my idea. And Shema and Simeon was known as a war tribe. That's what they were known for, for being warriors. Judges 1 and verse 3 tells us that. Judges 1 and verse 3, Judges 1, where we read, and I read you the verses so you know I can back up what I'm telling you, uh, Judges, and where did I go to? I went to Jude. <laughs> I knew that wasn't it, sorry, <laughs> forgot to put the G in. Judges 1 and verse 3, where we read, then Judah, Judah said to Shema, Simeon, his brother, Come up with me to the territory allotted with me, but we may fight against the Canaanites, and I in turn will go with you into the territory allotted you. So Simeon went with them. Okay, Judah knew they needed more warriors, and where did they turn? To Shema, to Simeon, because they were the warrior tribe. First Chronicles chapter four. Let's read that also. First Chronicles chapter four. And we're going to look at verses 42 and 43. First Chronicles 4, 42. From them, from the sons of Shimon, the Simeon, 500 men went to Mount Seir with, and it names these names, I'm not going to try to get through them as their leaders. They destroyed, verse 43, the remnant of the Amalekites who escaped and have lived there to this day. So they again went to war, they warred against the Amalekites, and then they settled and took over all of their land. They were just a warring tribe. And Levi, the one that's partnered with them, Levi, he slaughters the sinful brethren. Now, granted, they were sinful, and we're going to see that God does not curse them because they step up to the plate for God, but still the fact that they have the ability to do it, let me read to you what they do, because it, it is, you know, when you really think about this, wow. Exodus 32, Shemot chapter 32, and verses 26 to 28. The golden calf has happened. Moshe is very upset because he's coming down with commandments from God to find they've already broken. You know, and all that's gone on. Uh, the, the idolatry, worshiping a golden calf, dancing around it, orgies going on. It, it was a horrible, horrible scene. In verse 26, where we pick it up, Moshe stood in the gate of the camp and said, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered together to him. So as soon as he said, whoever's going to stand with the Lord, the tribe of Levi went immediately. That's why I say this was good what they did, but then listen to what they're asked to do, and they do it. Um, all the, what they all gather. He said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, every man of you put his sword upon his thigh, go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp, kill every man his brother, every man his friend and every man his neighbor. God's coming judgment is coming against them. It's going to be by the hand of the sword, by the, the tribe of Levi. And I mean, not everybody could stomach killing their brother, their friend, the, what was the third, the brother, their friend, and um, I can't believe how short my neighbor is right, my neighbor, thank you, thank you. So, they were able to do cruelty. They were able to be violent. But again, we see, and let me show you it, because that was devotion to the Lord. That was a boldness for the Lord. They were standing against the evil. And I do believe that the ones that God let fall by the sword were the ones that were in the idolatry, that were leading in that, that were calling others into worshiping the, the calf. I don't believe it was innocent people. I believe it was the guilty parties that, that were slaughtered that day. But look here what God says about it also in Numbers. I want to give you the full picture, not stop you halfway. Uh, Bamidbar, Numbers chapter 25, and starts with verse 6. You can read through verse 13. I probably won't go that far, but let's just see. Then behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a Midianite woman in the sight of Moshe and in the sight of the congregation. Let me shorten it because I know my time is flying. Okay. In the, in the face of God, right outside of the tabernacle, you had such a morality going on that one of the, the Jewish men took a Midianite woman and pulled her into a tent to have an immoral act with her. Okay. 
This so enraged Phineas, or Pichas, depending on which version you're reading it in, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aharon, the priest. Aaron is the tribe of Levi. So this one who's of the tribe of Levi, it so infuriated him that he rose up from the midst of the congregation. Everybody's watching it happen and letting it happen. He's flaunting it in the face of God. I can do what I want to do, and I can do it right here at, at the tent where God meets with us. And Phineas, because he, he rose up, he went after the man of Israel, he went into the tent, he pierced both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through the abdomen, through the body, so that um, they were both put to death. There was a plague that God was bringing on the children of Israel because of their immorality. And when he stepped up to this and called it out and said, no, we're not allowing this in Israel anymore. It's done. We're putting a stop to it. And he to, he brought them to death, which was the punishment for what they were doing. Then God stopped the plague that was coming against the, the children of Israel because judgment had not come. They were righting the wrong. But notice it was one from the tribe of Levi who had the stomach to be able to do what he did. And then I don't have, I thought I had down, um, but later we read that God chose the tribe of Levi to be the priestly tribe because they stepped up for God. At the first, as I showed you, when they first went against their brethren at the golden calf, because that tribe stayed pure, did not look at idolatry and took the stand against it and wiped out even their brother, if their brother had gone, had fallen into idolatry, then God said, they have the right to represent me. And so the priestly tribe moved instead of from the firstborn of each family to the tribe of Levi, the tribe of Levi. And we know Aharon, Aaron, Moshe's right hand was the Levitical tribe. Um, the priests would come through that line. So even though it's horrible, and when it's used rightly for God, God gave blessing to them for that. Let me see if I can finish five through eight back in Genesis 48 before we have to quit because that's all together, you know, that, that's these two. So I think I've done verse five well. Let's look at verse six. Let my soul not enter into the council. Let not my glory be united in their assembly because in their anger they slew men and in their self-will they laid off so. Okay, what it's saying, not enter into the council, not coming into, um, what? Where are you at? Verse 6, it's back in Genesis 49. Like yeah. And let not the glory be united with their assembly. That separation, they weren't to, Jacob saying, my soul, which the soul's representing the spiritual, it's not going to have counsel with these men. It's not going to come into thinking along spiritual lines together. It's not going to have that camaraderie. They're, they're just, their mindset is not that way. They're, they're, they're men of violence. They're, they, they are not spirit controlled. So I'm not going to counsel with them. If Nate Yahoo asked people who are hot headed to be in his cabinet, what would they be doing? Go kill them all, you know, take them all out. And there are those who are saying that on both sides, Hezbollah and Hamas and on the Israel side. I won't tell you there aren't those who are saying that, but um, what do they say? What kind of heads, like cool that expression? Heads. Cool heads prevail? Yeah, okay. And Ming has got to keep a cool head. And when he is going to act out, it has to be done right. You know, and that's what he's saying. You don't have that kind of head. I'm not going to counsel with you. I'm not going to tell the others to counsel with you. What more, my glory won't be united with their assembly. And that glory, that, that's the spiritual glory. So the spirit's not going to be joined together with them. And he repeats why. Because in your anger, you slew men. You didn't just, this is capital punishment. You, here's, you, you did the crime, now you pay the penalty. But they lashed out. And we saw that with what they did with the Shechemites and, and with others. And he's saying, you did it in anger. You didn't do it because this was a right, let's bring before trial and let's, you know, judge and, and let the judgment fall where it should. So they're still being called out. In the same way Reuben's water was uncontrollable, their anger was uncontrollable. That's what we're seeing here. And where, the, where they slew a man, that's Genesis 34, 26. That's back at, at Shechem. And where they lamed or hamstrung um, wantonly destroyed ox or the property 
That's Genesis 34, 27, and 28. Okay, let's read that real quick. It's not a good note to end on, so I'll try to find a better note to end on. But um, let's just read it to get that full picture. Uh, Genesis 24, sorry, 34. Genesis 34 and verses 27 and 28, where we read, Yaakov's sons came upon the slain and looted the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds and the donkeys and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and they captured and looted all the wealth and all their little ones and their wives, even all that was in their houses. So they went on, did I read 27? They looted the city because, it, yeah. So they, they took out the men who could have done war with them and then they went in and they, they looted the city, took all the wealth for themselves, and they went after the women and the children. They went after the innocent. Did so they killed the women and this, uh, Well, it says that they captured them. So I don't know that they killed them, but they, they became their slaves. They, you know, they lost their freedom over it. It wasn't something God could bless. And he doesn't bless it in the end with them either. So he's telling them, here's their consequence. And this is back in Genesis 49. Um, Here's their consequence that comes. We're ready to pick up in verse 7 of Genesis 49. My tablet's very slow. There we go. Okay. Cursed to be their anger, for it is fierce, and the wrath for it is cruel. I will disperse them in Yaakov and scatter them in Israel. So for their own good, he's not going to let them band together. Okay? Real quick. I had two little boys when I taught third grade. One was the leader, the other was the follower. The one who was the leader was smart enough to know when trouble was going to come, when he was going to get in trouble. He'd back out just in time, but his buddy didn't have that, and he'd get caught, and it, the judgment would fall on him. And finally, one day, I'd had enough because I knew who the instigator was. So I told him, if every time your buddy gets in trouble, you're in trouble. Whatever happens to your buddy happens to you. And he looked at me to say that's not fair. And I called him right out and I said, look, you know you're guilty. You know you're doing this. You just have that knack to know when to get out of the hammer that's falling. And he sheepishly put his head down and eat and argue a word with me. Okay. <laughs> These two were in cahoots. He calls them both out. He says, you, you, you're not good together. You get in trouble together. You encourage each other to do wrong. I'm going to separate you. That was the best thing that God could have done to them. Separate them because they'd be less powerful in their separation. So for their own good, they wouldn't be allowed to, to band together. And then I, and I see them all the time. Let me give it to you in a nutshell, then we'll pick it back up with what we see in the fulfillment of it. But Shimon, Simeon, he gets scattered in Israel, okay, because God said he would scatter them. When we see the divided kingdom and we see um, Judah, um, Israel is gone and we see Judah, um, we see there that Shimon had a, their, their, they had parts in Judah, all over in Judah's territory. This is what I'll explain better next week, that they get scattered all over in Judah instead of having their own area where they were gathered together. He mm -hmm. splits them up, okay? And, um, uh, and Reuben, I'm trying to hurry, not Reuben. Levi. Sorry, let me just, I, I'm trying to hurry through my notes. Um, let me tell you, Simeon, Shimon is going to become the smallest tribe. He's going to shrink down to the smallest of numbers. Then the Levites, they are rewarded, go into the priestly, but we see that they also aren't banded together. They've got 48 cities spread out throughout Israel. We'll look at those cities and where they were and the purposes of them. So even yeah. though they used it right, yeah. because it's better for them not to be all together and have all that, sorry, wrong, testosterone <laughs> you know, going through them that makes them want to do war, it was better that they be broken up. Okay, so God scatters them. Yes. So Levi's tribes were the ones that got that property that they paid for in all the areas. Right. The areas, right. So they were scattered. Yes. And future just thought, um, just because my friend thinks she's one of one of these tribes that got scattered and stuff like that. And in her research that yeah, that around the world these tribes definitely were the ones that got scattered the most 
in our future investment now as well. Actually, all 12 tribes got scattered eventually. We see the 10 northern go off into Assyria. We see the two southern get captured by Babylon, and Babylon has swallowed up Assyria. So you have the 12 tribes under Babylonian control, and they get, um, even though they come back into Israel, you have Ezra and Nehemiah, you have the rebuilding. Then you go to the time of Rome, you go to 70 AD when judgment falls again and the temple falls and the, the 12 tribes are scattered throughout. Yes, yes. And I stress that because I do not believe there are 10 lost tribes. Yeah. All 12 were represented. All 12 came back into Israel. All 12 went into uh, dispersion again in 70 AD. And God knows where everyone is because God says in Revelation 7 and repeats it in 14, 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes. So he knows. He's got it. The only ones that can know today for a fact, no matter what they want to say. Factually, the only ones that can are Levi's or Cohen's. Cohen means priest. Levi is the priestly tribe. That is a marker. And DNA has found a chromosome that is in that line. Everybody who's called Levi or Cohen has that chromosome. They know that's that tribe. So they can tell you. Now, anybody else who tells you is hearsay. They can say, well, my family passed down to me. Okay, that's good, but where is it on paper? It's not on paper. And the reason why I stress this is Yeshua had to prove what tribe he was from. He had to be from the tribe of Judah. So Yeshua could not come onto the scene in 2024 for the first time and say, I'm Messiah, I'm from the tribe of Judah. Here's my proof. It's not there. The records were destroyed. They've been destroyed all along, but they were especially destroyed in 70 AD. So the very fact that he had to come before 70 AD, the very fact that God let the temple be destroyed in 70 AD, why would he let the temple be destroyed if they were dependent on sacrifices for salvation? Has he condemned every Jew from 70 AD forward? No. You didn't need that sacrifice anymore because the Lamb of God had put his perfect blood on the altar and made a once for all sacrifice that would be good forever for any and all who would believe in him. So with those two proofs alone, 70 AD, he can't prove his Messiahship. And the fact that God let the temple fall in 70 AD shows Messiah had to come before 70 AD. Now, who fits the criteria? Who came from the tribe of Judah? Who came, was born in Beit Lechem? And I could go on over 300 prophecies in the first coming alone that he fulfilled. That if he didn't fulfill any one of those, he couldn't have been Messiah. But because he did fulfill everyone, it showed that he could be and is and would be Messiah. Amazing. I, I love what God does. <laughs> so I'm curious. Why then is there a new temple built and sacrifices being offered during the, during the tribulation time? Yes. Tribulation? If Jesus is paid at all, yes. is it because they have to go back and relearn and no, start over? No, it's because the Orthodox Jews who are starting up the temple and the sacrificial system again that we see happening in the tribulation do not believe in Messiah. So they don't believe that there is a a, a blood um, atonement that's been given yeah, for them. They rejected yeah. it. So they've got to get that started again. Right now, their hope, and they'll say, because God knows we don't have the temple, we can substitute prayer, we can substitute good works, and they try to do that. They're trying to earn their way. And they're saying, you know, God will have favor on us because we can't make the sacrifices. That is critically important to them to be able to make those sacrifices. That's why they've done everything to put the temple together, to have everything in order. Why they want a red heifer? Because they can't have a high priest without the red heifer ashes purifying the high priest to be in that role for them. So they feel the need for it still. That's why they'll do it during the tribulation. So it's not a God or thing. No. no, it's not his Zacchaeus temple. Yeah, his Zacchaeus temple is in millennium. From their viewpoint, that's still the way they need to go. Right, right, uh, I get it. right. They still are. In fact, I, I'm just studying, and maybe because I didn't get as far as I needed to in this week, we're going to, going to look just slightly at Jewish history, and I'm having a hard time backing up the source that I got. I'm not finding evidence against what it said, 
but I, I like it to be out of two or three witnesses. You know, I don't just grab it because one says it. But this one, new to me, said that in about 7 AD, the year 7, that the, the rabbinical leaders were crying out because in 7 AD, where Israel had been under the control of Rome for a while, they still were being allowed self-government to degree. Now, we know by the time that, that they want to kill Yeshua, that if the Jewish people were allowed, it would have been by stoning. But they were not allowed to carry out capital punishment. They had to turn to Rome, who was in control, and they had to get Rome to choose to execute, and Rome's way was via the cross. So that's why it went that way. But that this source is saying that the last um, thread of their own government was the ability to, to carry out capital punishment. And when they lost that, they meant that it, it meant they were totally under subjection to Rome now. And why they were crying out at that time was because the prophecy that we're going to come to that we didn't get to yet, and I'll revisit all this when we do, the prophecy in the tribe of Judah is that the, the royal, the, the ruling, would not leave until Shiloh had come. We're going to look at whether that's Messiah or a city. I'll show you what they're saying and why. But let me just short that for right now. What they were saying is Messiah was to come before they would lose control, before they would be in total subjection. So they were crying out, we've lost is total subjection, and Messiah didn't come. And they were literally crying. They, they, they were despondent over it. And the interesting note that the source also said is we all know Yeshua was born before 1 AD or zero. There is no zero. You know, you go from 1 BC to 1 AD. And we all know historically Yeshua was born before 1 AD. There's an argument over exactly what year that this source said they wonder if in 7 AD, when they were losing that control, if Yeshua had been in the temple as that 12-year-old who expounded the books, confounded the wise, was explaining things, and they're like, where did this child get this? Because God was showing them Shiloh had come, Messiah had come. And it was just prior to that time of losing that last shred of, of um, self-worth. Very interesting. I, I'm Definitely out there looking for more sources to prove it, but I found it very interesting that sadly our rabbinical leaders of today, the ones that are Orthodox that want to go by the Word of God, they're the ones looking to rebuild the temple. I've, I've talked personally to Bershon Solomon, who is the head of Temple Mount Faithful. He is a personal, close friend of one that's very dear to me. The one who's very dear to me is a believer and is a walking encyclopedia of biblical history and everything has started Bible colleges around the world. He's, he's amazing. Sit at his feet. You'll learn. You'll learn no matter what he talks about, you'll learn. They're personal friends, and he's had a chance to witness to this one, but Hershon is not yet a believer. He's looking for Messiah to come the first time, so he wants the temple for Messiah to come. He wants to get the sacrifices going because he feels the need for the purification. So that's the thrust, the push that is for it. And we do know that will be going on during the tribulation because the Antichrist is going to stop it, put an image in there and declare, no, you don't worship your God, you worship me. Even I think let's it be built with that thought in mind. You go build it, you do all the work for me, I'll take the glory. Ha ha, not for long. Okay, well, I mean, it's not like it was a secret that this child was born. What did they think of Christ? I mean, the people of Christ was born. But Mary had the baby. What do they, they think of him? Yes. They think he was an illegitimate son. They think he was not the son of God. And they even put out, not all of them, but there is a conspiracy theory out there that Mary had relations with a Roman soldier. And the result was Jesus. Wow. Yeah. You talk about blasphemy. Yeah, but no, they, they do not accept virgin birth. They, they, they don't accept, see, they don't accept the new covenant scriptures, the birth of the shop. They're only accepting mm -hmm. what's in the original. And the original is telling that Messiah is to come in the birth of the shop, the new covenant, the New Testament, we read he came. 
but they don't accept any of that. That's just stories. That's just. They try to make it the nation of Israel. The question was asked if you didn't hear what did they do with Isaiah 53? They try to put the nation of Israel in there. And even, and I have to be very careful because we're still on video, but in very general terms, the, the, a pastor I'm closely associated with who has a relationship with a rabbi who will remain nameless recently brought up that subject. And even this one who is, he says it's conservative, but honestly, he's more reformed than conservative, which is further down and away from the scriptures. He said, you're a messiah. I'm a messiah. We're all messiahs. We're wow. supposed to bring this and we're supposed to do this. And that's that's the answer. Either we that we've got to do this and, and we're failing miserably that we've got to do it, or the nation of Israel. Either way, go try to put either of those in Isaiah 53, just be honest with the scripture, read it in, in, in its purity, and it does not fit. It's obviously a single, the Messiah. And then when you take it willingly with other scriptures around it, you come to the truth. That you have to be willing to look at it truthfully and not listen to the spin, not listen to the excuses, not listen to what the rabbis say. And for the general, even those who go to synagogue all the time, they don't read Isaiah 53. When you read the scriptures every week, and we do it with our group, we do it. We take them through the scriptures that are being read. They read Genesis through Deuteronomy in order. So if I stop with Genesis 48.2 this week, I'll pick up with Genesis 48.3 next week. They read the portion. They divide it up every year. They go through all the five books. Then they read what's called the Hoth Torah. That just simply means after the Torah. The Torah is the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, in your English. Hoth Torah is the prophets, minor prophets, major prophets, all the prophets. They read a portion from that that they jump all over. So the last time they read from the prophet Isaiah, they read up through 52. But then next time they pick it up, and they don't realize because it's not next week, it's not for a while, when they pick it up, they read Isaiah 54. They skip 53. And if you ask them, if you call them out on it, they'll tell you it's too controversial, too hard for the, the lay people to understand. So we don't deal with it in our setting because that. We'll deal with that where we can one-on-one -on -one argue with each other, but we won't deal with it in that public setting. Proof that this has been going on for years, real fast, and I'm sorry to keep you late, but my dad had gotten, had come to believe in Messiah. Now, you've got to know it was 12 and a half years being witnessed to by a dear Gentile. Hallelujah. Praise you Gentiles who will take a, a stand to share the Jewish scriptures with the Jewish people. That's what you're supposed to do. Provoke them to jealousy. God was used in my dad's life. My dad came to faith. Finally, he tried everything from, he first tried being Orthodox and being a rabbi, studying to be a rabbi. He tried agnosticism, atheism. He tried wealth. He tried education. He tried everything. Nothing satisfied till he found his faith in Messiah. But when he came to believe in Messiah, he didn't pray those to an earth's prayer. He went out back of the church where he was, we're being witnessed to, but he went out back and he looked up to heaven and he said, if it's lasting, if it's true, first he says true, if it's true, and if it's lasting, if it's right, and if it's for the Jew, give it to me. No matter what it costs, no matter what it doesn't cost, give it to me. That was his prayer of accepting the Lord into his heart. We don't have magic formula or magic words. God knew he was opening his heart to the one that he'd been witnessed to, that it was Messiah Yeshua Jesus. He fell in love with the Lord. Two weeks that someone, her name, she's in heaven, her name's Mambo, she was his spiritual mom, she poured into him. They sat in Bible study all day, day after day after day. Two weeks into this, he's so in love with the Lord, the scriptures are coming alive, and they hit Isaiah 53. He saw Messiah Yeshua Jesus in it so clearly he said, this isn't in our scriptures. Now, remember, he studied to be a rabbi. He was being groomed for that. He, when he was bar mitzvah, he did the entire service. He didn't just do the bar mitzvah boy part. He did the entire service, okay? He says, that's not in our scriptures. There's no way that's in our scriptures. That's too obviously blatantly Yeshua Jesus. There's no way that's in our scriptures. And he thought, I could lie to you. These, these Christians, all this, this is all, they've made up this story. And he had to have proof. 
So he thought, I need a Jewish Bible. So he headed to the library because he didn't have one in his possession where he was. And he went and he pulled out the Jerusalem Bible that's printed in Jerusalem. It can't be more Jewish than that. And he said, with shaking hands, I pulled it off the shelf, standing right there in the, the aisle, opening it up. He said, I was scared to death. Isaiah 53 was not going to be there. And he looked and there it was. And it was reading word for word like what he had read in English. And he said, immediately, my heart just rejoiced. I can't believe in Jesus. And he was so excited that he did honestly say, moments later, his joy turned to anger. Why are the rabbis keeping this from our people? And that's partly what the Lord used to touch his heart to send him to his own people to share the truth. Because at first he said, the Lord, I'll do anything you want. I'll go anywhere you want. I'll talk to any people you want. But don't call me to my own. They're too hard. <laughs> and God knew that background he'd given him. Like Paul, he was in a waste that background. And he called him to his own people. And my dad used Isaiah 53 time and again. He used it with Rabbi Levy that he helped bring to the Lord. The Holy Spirit does it, but he used it. And even Rabbi Levy on his way was saying, I can see why they, the people say this talks about Yeshua. You know, when my dad said to him, well, who do you believe it talks about? He turned really red. He says, I don't know. But the next week when my dad went to class with him, he threw open the door and he said, I can no longer refute my Messiah. I'm ready to receive him as Savior. And he asked the Lord into his heart and joined us in our ministry. The Lord took both men to me. But it's there. It's there. If they'll if they'll be sincere in their search for God, they'll remove the veil of blindness and they will see that that's what we're dealing with. We got way off here and thank you for your patience. I hope it blessed you. It blesses me to share these that, um, we'll, like I say, when we get to Judah's prophecy and we're coming right up on it, hopefully I found other sources to back up that I'll still present to you again. I have no reason to doubt the source. It's written in. It's a good source that came to me. I just never jump out on a limb with one source. I always look for, so I've asked the Lord, bring me <laughs> other sources. But finding that bit of history, I'm finding is very difficult. They talk in general and they jump from here to here and they're not giving me what's going on right here and now. So hopefully something will come into my house. I'll let you know, stay tuned. Should be an extra lesson because Judah comes up that closer. But um, I'm gonna close real fast and then close with the word of prayer and then open it. Because I've yakety yakety yak, let's let you have a chance, okay? Good. Praise the Lord. He is awesome. And Lord God, we do praise you. Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, the scriptures do spring you. Every page is you. It is your story. It is your history. It is the future that you have prophesied and ordained, and it will be done. Every letter, every word, every jot, every tittle, every I dotted, every T cross, and we praise you. That gives us security, Lord. When you tell us that we're saved, we know it. And when you say it's forever, we say hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We pray. Open the, the veil, well, open the eyes, remove the veil of blindness from our Jewish people yeah. and from the dear Gentiles that need to know also, Lord. Let them have a hunger. Let them not be satisfied with anything till they come to saving faith. And we thank you that it's not fiction. It's not anything we have to put together. It is true. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And we praise you forever. Thank you for our salvation. And may we go out to share it with others, even as you have blessed us today. In your holy name, by the power of your Ruch HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, Amen.